Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. If we sit in a place of resistance, if we sit in a place of no, then only status quo exists. And so when we think about progression of the world and being empowered in that progression, we have to live in a place of yes. Time doesn't stop. Progression is inevitable. Change is inevitable. And we can choose to be empowered about that, or we can drag our heels in and be pulled along the entire way without being party to the experience. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. If you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with the author of The Creator's Mindset, Nir Bashan, and with podcast guesting strategist, Mei Kei Tsang, then do check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Gillian Bellinger who has been a corporate improv trainer for 15 years. She helps companies provide support to their employees through interpersonal communication skills, public speaking, and leadership development. She has taught workshops for PricewaterhouseCoopers, Amgen, Kaiser Permanente, Westfield Corporate, Cartoon Network, Luther College, Mount Aloysius College, Macy's, State Farm, A.T. Kearney, National Business Travellers Association, and Gilders Club, to name just a few. She has presented as a speaker at the National Association of Campus Activities and the National Conference for College Women Student Leaders. She currently trains for five different companies, Westside Corporate Creativity, Business Improvisations and Mind Gym, Hemsley Fraser and H2F Bookings and is in the process of becoming a board-certified professional coach. In our discussion today, Gillian talked to me about why we should create space to be open to possibilities which is critical to innovation. We talked about the power of self-reflection to adapt to and lead change. And we talked about lessons from improv to business and life. Without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Gillian Bellinger. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome today to the InnovaBuzz podcast all the way from Los Angeles in California, the USA, of course, Gillian Bellinger. Gillian is an improviser and also a corporate trainer, specifically working around effective communication and deeper relationships. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Gillian. It's a real privilege to have you here as my guest. Hi, Jürgen. Thanks so much for having me. Grateful to be here. Grateful that you and I could find a way to connect across across the world. So across the oceans, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you being open to listening and being in conversation with me. Yeah, well, let's get into that conversation. Now, Jay Suko, who was our guest on episode 340 of the Innova Buzz podcast, introduced us and suggested that we have a conversation. So big hello to Jay. Yeah, big hello to Jay. Talked to him earlier this morning, you know, can't can't talk to that guy enough. Guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is, yeah. And we had a fun conversation when he was on the show too. Good. All right. Now, Gillian, what, what drives you to do what you do? Yeah. um, Thanks for asking. So as you mentioned, I am a corporate trainer. I've been a corporate trainer for 18 years. And 
what drives me is this idea of of creating space in the uh, in leadership and development for organizations and team members and leadership to be open to possibility, to recognize when resistance is showing up for them, to enable them to remove that resistance or, or at least suspend it uh, and move forward into a place of possibility and connection. So for me, innovation lies in this idea of entertaining what's possible. It lies in this idea of saying yes. So I'm saying yes to you as a human. I am saying yes to the idea. I'm not saying I'm agreeing. I'm saying that I am entertaining an idea, a possibility, the recognition of you as self, and that you and I can be in collaborative conversation about what's possible. Is that a is yeah. that a, a useful answer? <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah, the of course the art of improv, which is where you've sort of honed a lot of your skills, is the whole idea of instead of saying but, right. you say yes and, which is is kind of that gateway to opening possibilities. And yeah. So is that how you see it? Yeah, I think so. So. You're correct that I have a, I am an improviser and have a background in improv, and that is really how I found myself in corporate training. Um, 18 years ago, I was a really young improviser in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and they needed a female trainer for for a company, for AT&T, actually, and I had never done anything like it um, at that time. There were fewer women in improv, so. I kind of got lucky. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And that launched me on a career that I never knew that I would have. I am still an improviser and I explore it artistically. What is really interesting to me about improv, though, is how does it apply to life? So how do mm. we take that same ideology of yes and you come to me with an idea, a problem, a human, uh, really anything. And, and I get to say, yes, I acknowledge what you have brought to me. And then the and is the bridge to what I think, feel, or do about it. I see it all the time, right? Like you look at someone like Elon Musk and that is a, a leader who says, yes, okay, this exists or this idea exists. And then and is the bridge to how I make that possible. And there is forward momentum in that ideology. Whereas mm. if we sit in a place of resistance, if we sit in a place of no, then there isn't an, then only status quo exists. And so when we think about progression of the world and being empowered in that progression, we have to live in a place of yes. Time doesn't stop. Progression is inevitable. Change is inevitable. And we can choose to be empowered about that, or we can drag our heels in and be pulled along the entire mm. way without being party to the experience. So what I like about improv is that if people can let go of this idea of improv as performance and embrace it as a philosophy, mm. it allows entry into the idea of being party to collaboration with change. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I kind of thought of improvisation for a long time as, you know, you have a problem and you need to solve it quickly the long-term solution may be, there may be a better long-term solution to this problem, but you don't have time to fix that or implement that right now. So you kind of put together a, an improvised solution, which solves the problem. And we've got a saying in our family, and this goes back to my younger days, I suppose, from my parents, but we still use it today and my kids use it, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it's a German saying, but it essentially says that, well, if you don't, if you can't uh, improvise on the spot and come up with a quick solution, you're lost. Mm. Um, it works better in German, but. <laughs> the, <laughs> it's, still, it's still true either way, right? It is still true. Yeah. So how can we take the, this idea of improv in terms of 
performance, improv, and take the philosophies and the structure and environment out of that and apply it to everyday life. Like, for example, if you're facing a problem or if you've, you've got an idea, an idea to do something and you want to create something, but you don't know where to start, how can we use the skills of improv to bring that to bear here and get underway? Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about it in organizational settings or even personal life settings, right, I use this in my own personal relationships all the time. One way that that I think about uh, implementing this from a philosophical standpoint in my own life or on an organizational level is linguistically. So looking at the languaging that I am using. So I can tell when I'm in a place of yes and, because my husband and I go back and forth. And then when we start to get irritated with each other, if I'm paying attention, I can hear a switch and I start, we start to butt each other. Um, and he will say to me sometimes, we are arguing to agree. Uh, and the reason we are arguing is because we have switched linguistically into a place of resistance. Uh, and that is true on an organizational level too. Looking at the culture of how a team operates. Are there methods in place to encourage languaging that is based in innovation. So doing things like having a butt jar with butt with one T, right? So like, yeah. um, or having an accountability buddy that says, you know, just gives you that subtle reminder, like pops their hand up, like, Hey, you use butt. Um, like I actively try and remove, remove it from my conversation if I can. Right. Hmm. When are the moments that I'm being very intentional about using butt and when are the moments when I'm not? The thing about butt is, is it is a subtle way of saying to someone, I covertly and subversively am invalidating you, whether hmm. that is your idea, whether that is you as a human, whether that is just a reflection of my own resistance. It is a subtle and powerful word that has a lot of impact. So one way is linguistically. Another way I think is lives in that place of developing culture. So what are the ground rules that you create for your organization? How do you set up meetings? When you think about a meeting, are you repetitively creating the ground rules? Everyone will talk. Every idea will be put on the board. We will know, we will set a timer, and for the first 20 minutes, we will be in a state of divergent thinking. So every idea will be on the board, regardless of whether or not it will work, to your point, whether or not it is a long-term solution, it will go on to the board. Because the more ideas that we cultivate, statistically, the more probability we have of finding a real, true, and effective answer. We have to create those ground rules, though. We have to repetitively build them into the culture of an organization. Otherwise, we don't create a space where people feel like they have the right to fail. And that's where psychological safety comes in. If people don't feel safe, then people don't say anything. If people don't feel safe, they're not going to give you their best ideas. They might not even give you any idea. You may never see the full potential of who a team member is unless there is space made for that person to offer ideas without it being attached to identity. So one of the ways that's very simple is creating ground rules that we use over and over and over as an organization to re-emphasize through action to team members, you're safe, you're safe here. I'm never gonna look at you as that person that had that bad idea. Your idea is amongst 20 ideas that are on the board. When that timer goes off, then we enter into a place of convergent thinking and evaluate what serves the problem. What serves the problem? I also think, 
that there is space for things to be evolutionary. So like you're, like you're saying um, that you're lost if you're not able to improvise a solution for the short term, that answers often are evolving. So the short-term answer and the long-term answer can exist. That it doesn't have to be a binary of one is good for now and one is bad for now. They can both be good in the current space that we are in. Right now, this is the solution. The next moment from now, this is the solution. Because it incorporates the idea of change. And change yeah. is inevitable. So <laughs> if we acknowledge it, and we incorporate it into our strategies, it allows us more empowerment to deal with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, so to mm. speak. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And it, it kind of, it reminded me of, of, I don't know if you're familiar with the ESIP model. It's um, something that one of, um, one of the trainers that I follow in the NLP space mm. came up with, and it talks about environment structure, implementation people and in a corporate environment in particular and certainly that's been my experience in the past when i was in the corporate world uh, if there's an issue or a problem or something needs to happen they went straight to the people thing without looking at mm -hmm. the environment so you talk about the environment creating a safe space for people to allowing people to fail you talked about structure in terms of repeating the processes that you go through and keep reminding people of those. And then, of course, the implementation is actually making sure you're following through on those things. And then you allow the people to kind of open up and be more creative. And so it sort of it, it fits in really nicely with that model. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, Irvin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, you talked about uh, identifying areas of resistance, so being open to possibilities, but identifying areas to resistance. Now, even though, um, you know, I kind of think I'm open minded and I think I'm open to possibilities, there's always an element of resistance to some change. There's always something, well, that that's not following the path that I want to follow right now. So how can we how can we be more aware of what's the resistance there and is it really serving me or do I need to let it go? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, um, which I think we can ask individually, right? I, as a human, can ask that question. I also think systemically an organization can ask those questions too. And I think there are multiple areas of support that can exist within that. One, I think, is reflection. So being conscious of setting aside time to reflect. Hmm. What is serving me right now? What is coming up for me as a problem? Is it a real problem? Where is there space for me to potentially acknowledge this problem and move into a place of potential possible solutions. So sitting in that divergent place for myself, right? How do I kind of cultivate a, I don't know if brainstorming is sort of necessary, it's kind of a, that's yeah. sort of a buzzy word that people aren't as big a fan of anymore. That being said, right? Sitting in the process of coming up with ideas for myself, right? So reflection, acknowledgement, reframing. Then I think another form of support is mentorship, is coaching, seeking coaching, I think is super helpful. It allows us, so, and I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Jurgen, but I have um, now finished the coursework for an associate coaching certification through the Flow Coaching Institute, and mm -hmm. I'm in the process of getting my professional coaching certification. So I've now become a big coaching advocate, right? Yay! <laughs> uh, and I think something that's really useful about coaching is that it creates space for that reflection with someone. And that collaborative experience can often reflect back to us what we're really saying. So having another human to function as a creative sounding board can be incredibly powerful in recognizing that resistance when it shows up. 
The same is true for a mentor and the distinction between coach and mentor being a mentor is a subject matter expert. So they are going to offer advice and they function as someone who has tread the ground that I want to walk, right? Hmm. So having a mentor offer insight around what, what does historically, what does this world look like? How do I create space for myself to move forward and what have they found in terms of how their own resistance showed up and where is that reflected in my experience? I think other ways that it shows up are, and I applaud organizations that are conscious of this, being an organization that is about being a growth mindset. So they invest in learning and development. They invest in building an architecture for their team members to continue growing, to continue thinking about learning, to be in a space of learning and actively cultivate leadership that is about development. So it's a lot of pieces yeah. and some of it are within our span of control and some of it are within the organization's span of control, I think is the, is the long answer to your question. Mm. Oh, as, as individuals, you mentioned reflection self reflection so as individuals how how do you suggest you could go about that and you you also talked about coaching and one of the things i think a coach does really well is ask a lot of good questions and force right. that reflection so is there a way that we can kind of take on board that coaching ourselves aspect not that i i'm suggesting that we don't engage an external coach because I, I certainly have one and uh, value her yeah. input highly but how can we um, elevate that whole experience so that we can coach ourselves in between times of seeing our own coach yeah absolutely I think part of it um, I, I think it's a, a multi-layered uh, answer right it's going to depend on the individual everyone mm. is unique and part of that will be exploring right so what resonates with you? What do you see the most progress from? What seems to be working? What doesn't seem to be working? So potential solutions that lay in that space are reading, uh, reading books by people who are exceptionally knowledgeable. Um, I prefer science-based uh, thought leaders, um, watching videos. TEDx, TED Talks, right? Who mm. are change makers? Um, I watched the whole Ideas Summit this year from Aspen. That would be another example of people who are really sitting in a place of innovation and challenging status quo. They're already moving outside the realm of, of accepted thought, right? They have already moved into possible. So reading, exploring what change makers are saying through video, documentaries, uh, talking to the people in your world, yeah. right? What kind of conversations am I mm. having? Like, can, uh, can I have, can I set a coffee date with a colleague and say, hey, I want to talk about this? Um, listening to podcasts like this one, uh, <laughs> engaging in conversations across the world, right? We have the luxury, one of the silver linings, I think of this year-ish, year into 2020 mm. and 2021, is that there has been an immense development in virtual connection. So now it's just that much easier to connect to someone else that we may not have ever have found before. So expanding that network, I think is also part of that conversation. How do you connect to people who are doing the kind of work that you love? How do you connect to people who are talking about different things? So choosing to step into those spaces, choosing to join those Facebook groups, choosing to connect on Instagram. We have the ability to connect in a massive way. So using those tools, I think, is part of it. I also think writing, right? So spending that time journaling and reflecting, like what is coming, what theme is coming up? 
Hmm. When I go back and read what I've written, what what was I saying a year ago? Yeah. Um, and that won't resonate for everyone, right? Hmm. What resonates for each individual is going to be different. I think the the key is to be in action with it. Yeah, yeah. That's there's a lot of great advice there, and I, I guess one of the, the highlights for me um, in what you said, and it kind of just rang all my but pressed all my buttons, rang all my bells, was the the whole idea of growth mindset and learning. And one of the things that frustrates me, and and I guess it frustrated me a little bit during my corporate career, and I didn't understand why at the time, was that organizations didn't necessarily recognize the value of training their employees to the extent, you know, they would train them for the job they were doing right now. Right. Um, they would give them, if there was something new coming on board to um, make that particular job perhaps easier or better, they would train them in that, saying there's a new system here to do your job better, so we'll train you in that. But they didn't take the approach of how can we grow our people? How can we grow them for the future? How can we train them to be better leaders, to be better listeners, to be better improvisers, to be better innovators, all kinds of things that were not necessarily directly related to their day-to-day -day job, but were certainly going to add value to them as people and then to the organization in the long term. So that's something that, that I'm certainly very passionate about and, and we spend a lot of time on growth, learning, reading, watching videos, listening to podcasts and so on. Yeah. And um, one of the things I've discovered recently is a thing called Readwise. And it's fascinating because that's um, that's helped me with some of the reflection stuff. Readwise is a service that um, you can bookmark or you can highlight. So if I'm reading a book on Kindle, for example, I will highlight sections that are relevant to me. If I'm reading a physical book, I'll actually take a pen or a, a highlighter to various sections. But the thing is, I often just, once I've finished reading the book, it goes away into the shelf yep. or into the digital archives and never comes back. Readwise actually allows you to capture all that stuff and connect mm -hmm. that automated and connects it all up. And then it's, and at a frequency you determine at the moment I'm doing it daily, it will send back anything up to 10 or so highlights of the past and so i'm seeing things that i read years ago and it's like, oh, oh wow and and I, it triggers thoughts and i thought why didn't i do anything with that at the time because that <laughs> really that really encapsulates what i'm thinking or feeling right now and what i'm working on right now and uh, so it's a, a really great way to refresh that oh i love that so, that's a yeah, incredible little tip suggestion there. Mm. yeah thank you now I'm I've not an affiliate or anything, so but <laughs> we'll So we'll take you we'll yeah. we'll know it's a meaningful recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um now you you still do a lot of acting and improvisation. Uh what what can we all of us do to improve our improv skills as they might benefit us in real life? And I I've been looking around for some because I've spoken to a lot of improvisers like Jay and yourself and and some other people, and I've been looking around thinking oh, that should be fun. I I could enjoy that and explore it, and I'm convinced you can learn a lot about that. And so I've been looking around for improv classes here in my local area. I haven't found anything yet. I've found acting classes and um, speaking, but not improv. So yeah, what's what's your tip for helping somebody like me improve my improv skills? Yeah, so I think you're onto something. Um, one tip I have is to take an improv class and mm. to connect to this idea of the silver lining of expanding our virtual connection is there are so many online improv classes now. So mm. if you don't have an improv class in your area, there is an improv class somewhere in the world isn't happening that, right now. Isn't that like, funny? I didn't even think of doing the, yeah. expanding the search there. Which... Uh, because no one can do it live classes right now. So yeah. everyone is offering them online, all of the big schools, uh, which is really an exciting opportunity. So mm. I have the teaching that I've done separate from corporate training, the improv teaching I have done has all been virtual. And most of my classes are filled with people who are not in Los Angeles. So it's a great 
moments in terms of what's possible. Um, so that would be one thing, uh, expanding the thought around, oh, like I can take a class that's being offered in Chicago. I can take a class that's being offered in India. I can mm -hmm. take a class being offered in London because they're all happening online. Um, another thing that I would think about is really anything that lives in play. So, so much of, I believe that resistance is based in fear, right? So fear of the unknown. The irony being that I am someone who is very afraid of the unknown. So I chose uh, a life calling that I think deals with that. I think I chose to be an improviser and to be a trainer because it speaks so personally to what triggers me. Um, and I have resistance come up. I have fear come up. I, we are in a very present state of the unknown right now. Change is very, very much happening. Um, and one of the ways that I think I deal with that is through play. So I think that that can manifest itself in so many different ways, right? It could show up as joining something new, right? That is to be in a, in, in willing to entertain the possibility, right? It could be joining a board game club. It could be joining, um, a swing dance class. It could be, you know, just doing anything you've never done before yeah. or doing something you used to do and coming back to it. It's you're choosing to step into a place of doing and that, I think, is inherently innovative. Uh, it, for some people, it could, could be a storytelling class, right? I'm willing to be in a state of play with my own brain. I'm willing to write down this idea and share it. Anything that is tangibly different than mm. what you have been doing, I think, it is the answer. Right. Yeah. I don't necessarily have an answer for someone because everyone's <laughs> well, so unique. Theme, experience yeah. is so unique. Mm -hmm. I think the theme through that is get uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah. I think yeah, that's a sort of put yourself in an environment that's different and new. And yeah. that for, kind of forces you to improvise, right? Because you've got to yeah. make, you've got to, until you know what's going on, until you learn how to deal with the situation, you've got to improvise to make do. So comfort in the discomfort. And hmm. what I mean by that is I often think of it as exercising a muscle. So improvisation is a muscle that we get better at exercising. And some people will say like, oh, well, you've been doing it a long time, so you must feel very comfortable. No, I don't. I do not like scenes will come and I will think to myself, I do not know what to do with this scene. I do not know what to do with this person. I do not know what to do with this idea. And that's okay. The part that I get better at is the part that is, and that's okay. Yeah, that's right. So when we exercise that muscle, we become faster at accessing the part of ourselves or the part of our brain even that is able to say, and that's okay. I'm still safe within this moment. I still am capable within this moment and I will still figure it out. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a key point, I think. And it comes back to what you were saying earlier, you know, we've got what we need inside us. And it was, it's, um, I mean, it come, I have this with my podcast because if I go back to the early episodes, I have had everything very carefully scripted and I did lots of research on the guest and knew everything I could find out about the guest through public domain, through internet search, mm -hmm. had listened to their speeches or their podcasts if they'd done some before and had a whole series of questions ready to go. And at some point I realized that that didn't make for a, such a good conversation. There are a few guests that I hit it off really well and I became comfortable to go off script. Mm -hmm. And the more that happened, the more I realized I don't need the crutch of that script. I just need 
a few conversation starters and maybe one or two key questions and then the rest of it I've got this and you know there was I remember a time when I think there was a guest that wasn't that prominent or hadn't put out a lot of information in the public domain and I, I kind of felt really uncomfortable going in it was a <laughs> It was a referral. I'd committed to uh -huh. interview that person. And I went into that conversation feeling as though, oh, this this could go really badly. And I'm glad I'm glad it's not live. I can still choose not to publish it. And it turned out to be a fabulous conversation simply because it was improvised. It was really the whole thing was improvised. And so I and you know, coming back to your point about it's a muscle you exercise, I'm I'm finding that more and more now simply by doing it and trusting it and saying, well, I feel uncomfortable here and that's okay. It's all yeah. right. I've got it. Yeah. And, and I think a, a big piece of that is your willingness, right? You were still willing to do the interview. You were mm. still willing to engage in the conversation and then magic revealed itself to you as a gift to your willingness. Hmm. All right. Um, so you also do, a, I noticed you do a comedy fiction podcast or you appear on a comedy fiction podcast. Oh, sure. Yeah. Is that, yeah Russell, Look at that research you're doing. Russell Martin. gets revenge or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, is I that mean, something you do a lot of? So I do a fair amount of voiceover. I mean, I am a, a TV actor. I do, you know, character stuff on, mm. on TV. and. I haven't done commercials in a long time, but I still audition for them. So, you know, if anybody's yeah. hiring. Uh, and I, I do projects as they come to me, right? So Russell Gets Revenge is one of the latest ones that I did and is getting a lot of, you know, good attention, I guess is the way to put it. And uh, it is a narrative piece a, a comedic black comedy around a guy who is seeking revenge um i definitely do a lot of character voices so i have another one coming up with some improvisers in georgia who are doing kind of a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where they sit in the restaurant at the edge of the universe and interview aliens so look mm. out for that one um <laughs> on my instagram and yeah i mean that's one of the things that I do love is variety. Yeah. I, I don't deal well with, with repetitive minutia. So having a lot of projects that are all kind of different is something that I really love about what I do. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I came across that one when I was doing some research in, into your background and I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? And most of the pod, well, pretty well, all the podcasts I listen to are business related or mindset related in some form. And I thought, well, that kind of reminds me of my childhood where, you know, before we had TV, you would listen to these radio shows where people would have, yeah, you know, people would act out the yeah. entire story through the audio medium. And I thought, hmm, yeah. I that's coming back here. Yeah, I mean, I think it is in a way, right? That there's a lot of narrative serials that that are a la, you know, 1930s radio shows, 1940s mm. radio shows that we still tell those stories. Like all mm. of those comics still are still have a life. And I think it's because those stories are about the essence of what it is to be a human. And I think we still see that. We still see that in narrative form through whatever medium we're trying to tell. It is interesting though, that, that something that is in many ways, like the essence of the past is just reinventing itself in a new yeah. version of now. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it is fascinating. And I had a thought before when you were talking about um, how we can become better at, at improv and the idea of storytelling and having an improvised storytelling podcast where somebody starts off with a, I mean, you probably need three or four people on this, but somebody starts <laughs> off the story and, and there's no script to it and it becomes a, a series. Yes. Well, there is uh, there is also a, a an improv form called a bat that you improvise in the dark. 
So mm. you can use it with just improvisers uh, during a rehearsal or something. It can also be a performance experience, which really is a radio show, right? The whole audience is mm. in the dark. All the improvisers are in the dark. We're having to generate who the characters are, why they're there, what like what the world and universe looks like. And it is really a lovely thing to be a part of because it feels very specific. It almost hones the improv in when all I can do is listen. It, mm. it makes it so much more specific. So if you ever have a chance to see a bat, um, a good example of it is um, Baby Wants Candy has a podcast. They are a very well-known musical improv group and they do a musical improv podcast where I I've been a guest on it before. And, and all you do is improvise with your voice where we're at a microphone. We're not standing up and it is essentially a bat, right? We don't have our eyes closed, but we can't, <laughs> we're not, we can't move. We can't move to make something. We have to make mm. it entirely with our um, voice. Mm. And it is interesting to like sit in that place of like you add a piece and I add a piece and together we make something new. Hmm. Interesting. Something to explore. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have, have links to the Baby Wants Candy podcast in the show notes as well. People can check that out. Now, I'm just aware of the time, Gillian, and I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And it's five Thank questions you. that uh, hopefully – you'll inspire, well, your answers will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. Yeah, great. Can't wait. So what, I'm ready. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. What's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? I think they need to incorporate yes and. Literally use the words. Use I know it word, feels yeah. pedantic, but you're working that muscle. Use the words yes and. Yes and. That's right. The um, I did want to make a comment before. Yeah when you contrasted the yes and with the yes but and where i see the yes but used so much is people providing feedback and they say jillian that was a wonderful performance but and of mm -hmm. course all, all you hear is what's after the but you don't hear the bit about the wonderful performance so the language and the way you use it is so important, isn't it? So Yeah, yeah. I mean, the but basically is invalidating everything that came mm. before it. That's what it means. Yeah. Uh, and if we talk about neuroscience, we talk about the work of Daniel Kahneman, that we have a negativity bias. Like mm. humans feel the but, we hear the but, the but matters more than yeah. whatever came before it. Yeah. So it it's impactful. Mm. And And simply by using the yes and you can still deliver the exactly the same message. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly, Jurgen. You but can hmm. connect it. Yeah. You did a great job on that podcast and here's what I thought about it. Those two hmm. ideas are not in competition with each other. Hmm. They can both exist in the same space. Yeah. All right. Now what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Um set aside time to be divergent. So Really sitting and usually in communion with someone else. So like mm -hmm. Jay Sugo is a great um, resource and he and I will spend time when we are in in, uh, in process with a problem or maybe even artistically in process coming up with ideas. Um, another way that I do that is in coaching sessions. So when I am being the coachee, I will sit in that space of like, being divergent, actively setting aside time to be in that space. Hmm. Great. I love it. Yeah. And the, the divergent thinking, of course, that comes from using that language of yes and very yeah. consciously. And then, okay, what is that? What possibilities come up now? Yeah, exactly. Hmm. And, and making sure that I'm not editing yet. I'm just in a spa space of coming up with the idea. Hmm. So. All right. Wonderful. Do you have a favorite resource you use most often? Hmm, that's a really good question. I I think people would be my answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think uh, that there are so many interesting and talented people in this world and 
really listening to people Mm. is what I have found most effective, right? Like you educated me about Readwise. (laughs) I wouldn't have heard about it, right? I'm going to go look it up now and, and see how I can use it, right? So recognizing the currency of humans, I think is incredibly powerful. Hmm. Yep. And, and you mentioned earlier also about that we have the ability these days and we've been, it's been highlighted to us in this year of um, global pandemic that we can connect with anyone in the world if we choose to. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, the world is, I know that there are downsides to it as well. And we also have so much more possibility than ever before. Yep, that's right. And people are recognizing the possibility, yeah. I think, much more than before. Hmm. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Hmm. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track when you're working with them? Yeah, I th- so I think language and accountability, right? So like managing expectations from the beginning, having them at the top, like define what does, what does success look like for you? What would be a successful outcome? And then working our way backwards and establishing here is the expectations you can have of me. Here are the expectations I have of you. When we are in a collaboration, we are working towards this goal that you have defined. (laughs) Mm. And Part of that may be sort of strategically working backwards, like how do we get there and and working through that together in a way that acknowledges those ground rules. Like I'm always trying to stay linguistically in a place of yes and, even if a client says something that I, I don't like or agree with, right? The yes is the acknowledgement. Yes. And here is what I think about that, which, you know allow space for both ideas to exist Hmm. and for us to find a pathway together to that end goal. Yeah. I love it. I love the, the idea of starting with the end in mind and getting really clear about what does success look like? Um, That's one of my favorite questions when I look at, look at, um, okay, what's our goal here? Yeah. What, yeah I, what will you see? What will you hear? What will you feel? What will be? What will we be talking to one another about? Yeah. Who will you be with? A whole lot of questions around that. But essentially, what does success look like? And get them to paint a really vivid picture. And yeah, then, it, it, and it then, creates, yeah, like you say, yeah, and then, like you say, you can always come back to that. So you remember when we talked about this picture of success? Well, exactly. Hmm. Love it. Exactly. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? So I have been thinking about this question, and I think that a leadership narrative is a really interesting idea to explore, which is essentially multiple components put together that define who you are as a leader. So Another way of saying it is your personal brand, right? Another way of saying it might be your leadership story. Who is it that you are as a leader? And that could be expertise. That could be personal values. That could be um, what you see as a vision of the future and putting all those things together and making a clear, concise statement of who you are as a leader. That is your unique voice. That is your unique definition of you as a leader. Are there other people that are experts? Sure. Would they say it the same way that you do? No. So carving out that time to really craft that leadership narrative and think about like, what are the elements of who I see myself as a leader, both personal, both professional, both value oriented, both expertise and both, uh, and and forward thinking, right? So Mm -hmm. How do I fuse all of those things into one concise statement that sets me apart, that defines who I am as a unique individual? Hmm. Yeah, I love it. And it kind of speaks to some of the work I've been doing with myself and and the idea of making marketing human again. And, and yes. the more I reflect on that, the more I 
kind of, you know, it's a lot of your language there has sparked off the, the ideas. But the more I reflect on that, the more I realize, well, you know, that can apply to podcasting, that can apply to networking. So all these things that I'm doing, I'm kind of adding that flavor in there. And now I'm starting to state that in in all of those areas. So it's such a simple three word phrase that um, expresses that vision and yeah, the differentiator. Yeah. And, and really, I think the cost of it is time and the mm. gain of it is limitless. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we define it, then, then there is so much power that comes from that. Mm. And it kind of focuses, like for me, it focuses my mind and I speak to somebody like you and listen to the ideas that you're expressing. And then that kind of triggers things because I've focused I've got this unconscious focus on mm. the areas that I'm working on and all these new inputs come in and add to that. Yes. Mm. Inputs. That's a great word. I love that, that word. Cause it, uh, it allows space for there to be multiple. There are yeah. multiple inputs to who we are as an individual and all of those create that unique voice. And if we're able to like have clarity around what that filter is, it only moves us further towards making an impact. Hmm. And that's right. Making an impact is, is the big thing, I guess, in terms of well, differentiating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we all make an impact whether we're conscious or um, intentional true. about it or not. So why not make an impact that's positive and actually leaves a, uh, the world a better place than when we came here. That's right. That's right. I I think of impact as the other side of the coin of intention. So intention is one side of the coin and impact is the other. Mm. And, you know, we can be intentional about the impact that we leave. Mm. Um, and it is it is interesting to think about how we make an impact even when we don't mean to. So having an awareness around that allows us to make it for good or for ill. Hmm. Yep. Or, Correct. Yeah. I mean, not that it has to be binary, right? There's all shades hmm. in there. That's right. It does give us power though. Hmm. Yes. And we can choose and we can be conscious about changing what we do, changing our behavior if we're not comfortable with the impact that something is having. Yeah. Hmm. Great. Well, thanks, Jillian. This has been absolutely fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about you and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Yeah, absolutely. So I am on Instagram at Jillian Bellinger, and Jillian is with a G. Um, you can also connect with me on my website, which is bellingercoaching.weebly.com, and Weebly is W-E-E-B-L-Y, weebly.com. <laughs> yep. All right. And we'll post those links in the show notes as well so people can click straight through. So do you have some parting advice for the listener today? Hmm. So... Good question. I think my advice would be to sit in that place of growth mindset. So ask yourself if you're there, right? Are you, are, do you feel stagnant? Do you feel like you're in a place of sameness? And if so, is that something you want to change? And mm -hmm. if it is, taking a look at what kind of mindset you're in. Um, Carol Dweck wrote a book on growth mindset. She's the science behind the idea. So one step would be reading her book and evaluating, like, where does this fit in my world? How is this showing up? And then making some choices around what progress looks like for you. How can you continue to be in a space of learning? How can you continue to allow yourself just the philosophical understanding that our brains can change that our brains can continue to grow mm. and that we are allowed space to be learners our entire life so whether you are running an organization or in an organization where does that fit 
Where does that fit on your day to day personally? And where does that fit for you on an organizational level? And what kind of impact can you make for the good, allowing space for that learning to be? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's great. And I'll have to check out. I'm not familiar with uh, Carol's oh, book. Yeah, Carol's book. Yeah. 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 Uh, but you you reminded me of another book, so I'll throw that one in. Um, yeah. I think it's I think his name's Norman Doig, Doig or Doig, um, the brain that changes itself. Okay. Hmm. So Writing it a down. Of, a couple of good book recommendations for the listener as well. I love it. All right. Well, finally, Gillian, who else should I get on this podcast for a conversation, and why? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So I'm not sure if you have connected with him already, but his name is David Escobedo. And he is an American improviser living in London and has is a PhD candidate and really a change maker in terms of the intersection of improv and social justice. So yeah, really thinking not... about how improv changes the world. Go ahead. Great. Yeah, I'm not familiar with David, so I'll, oh, I'll get an introduction from you and we'll reach out to him and see if we can get him on the show as well. Great. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, Wonderful. thank you well, so much for your time, Jurgen. Thank you, Julian. I've really enjoyed this. It's been fun to have this conversation. We've kind of explored a lot of things around mindset related to improv, um, around creating change or responding to change and also around learning the whole aspect of learning and there's been a few book recommendations along the way too so i've really enjoyed the conversation thanks again for sharing your insights so generously and all the best for the future let's keep in touch yeah thank you it's been my pleasure bye bye <laughs>Hope you enjoyed that fabulously informative and engaging conversation with Gillian and took something away from her episode. Gillian's focus on growth mindset and how she uses lessons from improv like creating safe spaces and self-reflection were highlights for me. I'd love to know what you took away from Gillian's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Gillian Bellinger. That is G-I-L-L-I-A-N-B-E-L-L-I-N-G-E-R. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Gillian Bellinger. You'll also find contact information there for getting in touch with Gillian, as well as links to her website, her social media pages, and the other resources we spoke about in our conversation today. Now, if you like this episode, please do share it with two other people that it might help. And tag me in on that share so that I can reach out to you with a special surprise thank you gift. Gillian suggested that we have a conversation with improviser David Escobedo on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So, David, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Gillian Bellinger. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast where we've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including playwright and screenwriter Sheldon Shaw and Anna Adams of Wicked Marvelous. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.